to Jen. Okay. Maybe not. Oh, hold on just a second. Well, actually, um, you need to give it to me to share the screen. You know what I mean? I do. Okay. Oh, there it is. Oh, you got it. Okay, good. Yep. Excellent. Don't look at my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> That is such a window into my world. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're safe, you're safe. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I could see by some of the names, some of you I know a little bit, so I'm glad to have you here. And we will get started. Um, Ayanna's probably gonna have me do, we'll do a couple little breaks and she's sort of my timekeeper today to make sure that I don't go off track too much. So um, I had asked you all to send in what social media, digital marketing, application software, et cetera, that you're using. And so primarily almost everyone said Facebook, and then it was kind of about evenly split between Instagram and Twitter. Those are the three primary that I'll be looking at in terms of social media, but then I'll also talk a little bit about email marketing and how that relates to all of them. Um, so what I wanted to do at the beginning was just sort of show you some examples from where I work about how we're, in particular, because we're really only on Facebook at this point, um, doing things at Caritas Clinics. And so um, building community is a really important part of what you can do with social. Um, you can just see here, we had a bunch of KU students helping us out. Here, one of our staff members um, was at a parent as teachers program. And folks love to see the inside workings of your organization. They want to see the personality, you know, who are these people? They, it's a way to build trust. They want to get to know you. So let them see inside is why one of the reasons social is so great. Um, one of the other reasons is advocacy. I'll I'm going to be talking a little bit about how you can create templates like this um, towards the very end of the session. But one of the great tools for social media is to do advocacy work. Whatever you want your community to be learning about the field that you're ministering in, what you're doing, and how it fits into an overall picture policy-wise, um, whether there's legislation that's coming up, whatever it might be. So advocacy is a great way to use social media. And one of my favorite ways is stewardship. And so, um, you know, I feel like I, when I use stewardship, mostly I'm using it with foundations, um, with other community organizations that we try to partner with or that we um, engage in other kinds of shared activities through donors who support us with events, companies who may be sponsoring an event of ours. Um, and I just, I love the energy that can happen when you share your gratitude with the community that's supporting you. It can be sort of amazing and magical. And then there's just different mission stories. So, you know, we're trying to pay attention to specific awareness days. And there are, um, if you have some questions, you can just search online for awareness days and it'll give you every kind of possible um, national day. And, you know, making a list of those and knowing what really fits with you all. And then for us during Heart Awareness Month is when we had all of our staff um, recertified in CPR. And so here's a couple of our doctors, our um, bilingual Spanish interpreter, and we tagged the um, American Heart Association and our local fire department who helped to administer the program. So in doing so, then as soon as you tag and link to somebody else, it helps increase the reach of your posts. And that's what we're all going for, is trying to spread the message Finally, this is just a reminder to have a good time, have fun, show the personality of your organization. There's all kinds of ways to do that, and I encourage you to do that. Some of us who are a little older, I think, um, rely a lot on a print mindset. So every kind of marketing or advertising we did, it had to be perfect before we published it. And whereas with social media, you can have a little bit more leeway. And so, you know, take some chances, see how people respond. Folks actually loved this post with our staff. It was during a staff meeting. 
Whoa. I have no poker face and since I can't see your reactions, <laughs> I have no idea what, I, what my face looks like. Okay, um, best ways to increase capacity and efficiency. Because that's the thing we're all wrestling with. We don't have time. We don't have enough hours in the day to do this. And so there's just a few ideas that might be able to help you. So um, one thing is recruiting social media ambassadors. So pay attention to who are the people who are always liking your posts, who are always commenting. Potentially those could be people that you could lift up into a volunteer role as a social ambassador. It's easy to add them as an admin. You just might need to have them abide by certain policy that you guys develop related to what to post, not to post. But once you have a good plan set up, you can really leverage that plan and use other staff and volunteers. In our organization, we have a few staff members who always um, comment and post. And so my next step is to try to get them to become one of our social media ambassadors and they're a staff member. Um, and they work in just a totally different area of the clinic. I referenced this a little bit about having a plan. So re related to reviewing any cause awareness days and then review any dates that are important in the life of your nonprofit. There may be um, a founder's day. There may be a particular anniversary that has resonance for your community and note all of those on some kind of a calendar format. And that way you can begin to build a plan. Um, other thing is to think about what are maybe important things going on in your community. I'm in Kansas City, so I mentioned the Royals opening day, plaza lights at Thanksgiving. So are there other things going on in your community, going on in your community that you can find a way to piggyback on? And <clears throat> this is my favorite, don't be afraid to say no or that's enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it can be really overwhelming when you start thinking about all the possibilities and planning. So if you start to feel that way, just pull back and just, you know, as I tell one of my staff members, I'm like, I mean, I'm like, based on this past month we've had, if we even made one post a week on Facebook, I say that's a win. So there's sometimes it's just going to be busy and it's going to be really hard. So I always invite people to not be too hard on themselves. One of the ways that works for me related to time management of all of this is to do everything you can to develop the content in advance that you know will be true. You know, maybe um, you know at a certain day that's going to be the opening of your program calendar. Maybe it lasts two weeks or maybe you're doing a series related to a sermon series and you know when that's going to happen. Those kinds of things you can build the content for in advance and plug them into a calendar. And then what you want to do is you want to try to block about 20, 15, 20 minutes a day on your calendar even just set a timer so you only do that and just review, respond, and engage your supporters. And try not to get distracted. This is the hardest part for me. So we call it the rabbit hole. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jen goes down it really fast. <laughs> um, the other things are there's nothing wrong with repurposing content. So there, you know, you may find that um, you do something on Facebook and then you adapt it slightly for Instagram or you put it into your email newsletter. There's no problem with repurposing it, but it's important to pay attention to what might be your goal related to that particular media platform. And my theory too is it's better to be consistent in one place, meaning like one social media outlet, than to be everywhere, which really ends up being nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you find yourself feeling overwhelmed, then just think through what's the one social media platform we're going to use and let's just focus on doing that one well and just back off from thinking you need to add anything else. Um, I always tell people, and some of you have probably already heard this story, but when Periscope came out, I was just, I was at my wit's end. I'm like, there's no way I can learn another social media platform. And so I didn't. And then before you knew it, Facebook Live came along. So any real purpose for me understanding Periscope was gone. So I'm all about being a slow social media adopter. 
not too slow, but slow enough that you don't drive yourself crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it is important to have some sense of your guidelines for your content. Um, what you post, how you post, maybe what are some of the limits. It doesn't have to be exhaustive. It could just be really simple. But think about it from an outsider perspective. What are people going to need in order to post things on your site that are meaningful? Because that is how you're going to use this more often than not will be uh, related to any of those volunteers or people you bring in to help you increase your social media presence. Time management is essential for everything related to social media. So, we're going to transition in to a little bit to talk about goals. So, if you all have, and even if you don't, that's okay, but this little worksheet that was sent out to you will kind of walk through and have you fill this out and come up with one specific goal. And also, just kind of forgive this because because it is from Constant Contact. It's very business related, so some of the words we have to translate into our own nonprofit language. So some of the goals you can have for social media: increasing engagement. How many people are liking your page? How many people are commenting? How many people are sharing what you do? They say that in um, if the uh, different kinds of engagement on Facebook, for example, if they were worth money. A like would be a dollar, um, a comment would be $10, and a share would be like $100. So anytime you're getting someone who actually loves what you're doing enough to share your content, that's going to lead to a lot more reach and a lot more engagement, more people liking your pages. Because Facebook is making it increasingly hard for us to engage. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, connecting with new prospects, you know, we all go online to research new nonprofits or new organizations or something that we're curious about. And, you know, those Facebook pages will come up in folks' Google search. So it kind of is essential that a minimum you have Facebook. Recruiting volunteers can be a great way. I made a call for help um, with something related to an event coming up. And I've got like 10 people volunteering to help us. It's a great way to celebrate milestones in the life of your organization, in the life of maybe some of your staff, especially people that are well known in the community. Thanking all your donors and volunteers for their support and then fundraising. So why don't you take a second and think a little bit about what would be one goal for you for social media. And while you think about that, I want to lift up and I'm actually going to call out Casey for this one because Casey's MBA's marketing specialist as well, and she's on this call. Um, Jose from Kansas City asked, is there a place to look for a good plan, a good uh, social media policy um, or good social media guidelines? So I wanted to pose that to Jen, you, and as well as Casey. Casey, you can answer via chat to everyone. Um, you know, I would say, honestly, I go to Google and search, and that's, uh, that's where I would go and just see who I can find um, and who's, whose examples I like. I mean, just really simply, I don't have one immediately yeah. off the top of my head that I really like. When we were, when I was working for a seminary, we used a netiquette document that was handy um, just for sharing good behavior on the internet. Um, but then beyond that, you also can build guidelines that are specific to your organization, like um, we're not going to advertise for other for-profits. Or, you know, if, like if you have a business, a catering business, please don't, you know, post your catering businesses advertisements on our nonprofit page. You know, those, those kind of sort of um, things that <coughs> you'll have to think through what, what's most important for my organization. Um, but as Jen said, you can always um, search around on the internet and find some starting places, some templates, and some things to get to. Sorry, I'm coughing. <laughs> oh, okay. There's a few folks who don't have the worksheet. So I think that just means you may have registered after I sent it out. Um, 
So maybe Jen, you could talk us through it. And at some point I'll make sure over the course of this, that we get an email to everybody. And even if you don't have it, it's fine because just think about of those goals that I showed you, just choose one or something like that, that you would want to have for your goal. Because then what we want to do is have you think about what would your objective be to achieve that goal. So I imagine most of you know about SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and depending on who you talk to, either T stands for time bound, meaning it has a, a deadline, or that it's timely. So think about the goal that you chose, and here's a couple examples. So if one of my goals was to increase engagement, I might choose, I'm gonna gain 200 new Facebook followers by the end of the year. Or I might recruit five social media ambassadors to help me implement my social media program. And then with regarding thanking donors and volunteers, one thing could be that I'm going to respond to social media posts and comments, questions, and shares within four hours. One of the things, as many of you probably notice, it's really important that if someone reaches out to you on social, in Instagram, they have like, you can have the private direct message, Twitter can, Facebook. It's really important, and that's why that's scheduling that 15, 20 minutes a day to make sure that you're catching anyone who's commenting, asking a question. And so first you always wanna take care of those folks. But then after that, you know, you wanna kind of look at who's sharing your content. So if you see someone who has shared something of yours, comment back to them, thank them for that. You know, um, if you see some other nonprofit who decided to tag you in something, respond to it. Remember, the most important thing, the way to think about social media, it's all about a conversation. So in order to have that conversation, you need to be going back and forth. Um, when you think about the content that you develop for your social media, really be thinking that 80% um, of it is sort of just useful content. 20% of it is promotional. And a friend once described this to me as like, you know, it's kind of like if you go on a date with somebody and all they do is talk about themselves, you're not likely to call them again. Same way with social media. You want to make sure that you're out there sharing other kind of content that can be helpful to people because it's, you know, um, it may be someone from another organization. It may be, you know, um, some other person, whatever it might be sharing all of that, all those useful ideas like the advocacy and educating people that may go beyond just your organization or ministry in particular to a much broader group. And so um, be thinking that you want like 70 to 80% of what you do to be that kind of messaging. And then the rest is really where you do more promotional that's directly about you, your organization, and what you're doing. So as you go through and think about your objectives, so maybe one of them in increasing engagement, you're hoping that you're going to have more engagement with millennials or with folks who have recently retired you really need to narrow down your audience because we can't make um, effective planning and strategy if we wanna say that our audience is everyone. And so I know for where I am right now, we're specifically focused on trying to get social justice committees, committee members of a number of particular Roman Catholic churches learning and involved about what we are doing. So there might be a different way that you post based on who that audience member is. So give it some time and think about what are the different audiences that you have. And maybe if you do that, um, maybe put some of those in the chat box or in whatever way to let us get a sense of who are your different audiences. Sometimes your audiences are internal 
Um, sometimes they're external, a mix of both. I'd love to know what folks are thinking about that. And then as you do that, then you begin to refine your messaging and you need to understand where are they on social media. If you are really interested in reaching out to teenagers, whether that's you know a group that you want to be marketing to, definitely not going to be on Facebook because that's not where they are. So then you're going to be looking at whether that is um, Instagram, is where a lot of them are, or as we all know, Snapchat, which I don't know as much about Snapchat because I haven't. That's one of those I haven't gone down the path yet. <laughs> Um, but those are the areas where you need to be, is wherever your audience is engaging on social, that's where you need to be. This is great. Thanks, you guys, for those of you who are popping in on the chat window. Um, some of the examples that we're seeing are 20 or 30-something urban professionals. Mm -hmm. um, a one who spoke of his church, our audience is mainly internal, but interested in working on making it external. And I'm sorry, I said his, but it might have been her. Um, but yeah, keep, keep pushing those out. Let us know who your audiences are, who you're trying to reach. Um, this can be a hard question for churches, I think, because you do want to, you know, you want to welcome everybody. You want to be there for everybody. But I think once we tune in our eyes just a little bit more, we recognize that there are some audiences that we're really going for. Sometimes it's a neighborhood. Sometimes it's an apartment complex. Sometimes, um, it's, uh, um, a certain kind of uh, uh, folks who like a certain kind of worship or a certain kind of music or have a certain amount of time in the morning. Maybe we want people who work nights because we have the morning, early morning church and we know we can get them after work and then they can go home and go to sleep. But you see where I'm going? There's just, even as a church, there are ways in which your ministry is better fit um, for some folks than for others. So give us a, a sense of those audiences. I see one is saying mostly elderly. That's good. That's great. And there are more and more older folks, right, Jen, on social media now than there were before? Oh, absolutely. Facebook, um, because everybody, everybody wants to see their grandkids. <laughs> that's why they get on Facebook. That's fair. Yeah. Um, Oh, I see. Some of you um, are sending you sending me your answers, and that's awesome. Um, but you're addressing them to all panelists, so everybody can't see them. <laughs> um, so keep doing it, but just remember to change that little drop-down menu to all panelists and attendees. And is just is there a way I can't see what anybody's doing? You're you'd have to move around to get your menu bar up again, which it may not let you do if you're in the full screen option to show your your presentation. All right, I'm just going to trust you to share. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll keep talking for you so that you can. You can That's what I need. Mean. <laughs> um, so after you think through, like, if just pick one or two social media goals and objectives that you want to work on between now and the end of the year. And then it becomes like, okay, so how do I begin to track this? And so there are so many different ways to do it. I mean, and it all works depending on who you are and how you work best, what kind of planners you like, whatever. So this is an example that I show the picture from CoSchedule. And I thought that was pretty cool. If somebody loves their different post-it notes and colors, they could make it that way. Um, you can just use straight calendars that you write in, um, Excel spreadsheets, tons of people can use Excel, scheduling applications, which I'll talk a little bit about, and then project management software. So right now, um, where I am, we're using the free version of Asana. And so we have gone in, and you can, maybe you can see in here where we have in social media, what were some of the important days that we wanted to make sure that we did something for. Um, and then you can see when our goals were to have our newsletters go out. So we use this to sort of track what's going on. And because I have somebody else I work with, we can go back and forth a little bit to make sure that we're getting everything we need to. We use it, as you can see, to track other things too. Um, but it works pretty well. But <laughs> one caveat, you have to remember to look at it. So as with all planning mechanisms, build something that's easy for you to integrate into your daily activities. And here's some resources that um, I'll be sending this um, 
we'll be sending this out to all of you after the fact, but some different planning steps, different templates for editorial and content calendars. And then these are three project management tools that I've used. Asana, which I just showed you, Free Camp, and Trello. Trello is somewhat similar to Asana, except it's a little bit more visual, the way it can be set up. You can also have a free version on that. Free Camp, so for those of you who have always wanted to explore Basecamp, but as soon as you see the price of Basecamp, you realize there's no way that's going to happen. Free Camp is an option that was created that in many ways is very similar to Basecamp, but it's free. Uh, up to a certain point, but as a nonprofit, you can request to have a premium subscription and that will give you access to all of the tools for free. So um, there's no harm, no foul. You can give that one a try and see if you like it. And they're getting better and better. They're on the verge. I don't know, they may have released an app or they're getting very close. Well, why don't we take a pause here and take some questions? So one question that Jamie just lifted up, uh, Jamie has a church called The Lighthouse and he's trying to reach African-American LGBTQ folks. Are there any creative ways to reach or engage this population on social media? Do we have any stats on that or any uh, advice floating around? The only, the only, no, I don't have a lot of specific LGBTQ stats, but I will say that I think um, Instagram is probably a better place to be um, because Instagram, there's so much about how it's used that I feel really reflects creative voice and the arts and really using that to lift that up. And I think, so you just by your nature have um, a community on Instagram that might have more affinity so I think you might be seeing more there. And that's one place I would look at. But as for anything in particular that I've read, no, I don't have any answer. And having stopped by the Lighthouse, I think that's a good insight for them as it's, it's a pretty creative place. So I think I, I'd agree with your assessment there that the flexibility of Instagram and the visual media that it is would be a really great fit for them. Mm -hmm. Now I had someone ask a question um, on email to me before this, um, before we, before the webinar started, I'd like to pitch that to you. This, um, and this is just what I was talking about in terms of regions before, this person asked um, for recommendations in setting up an institutional Facebook presence for a region where different ministries might each have a page and then staff might have professional pages. Um, and they're looking for the ability to pass a ministry page from one person to the next. For example, if the regional minister has a page and they retire, how can the next regional minister get that same page as opposed to each of them using their personal page? Um, you're just gonna, you're gonna need to make sure that, um, so Facebook pages are uh, location specific for the most part. So you're right in the fact that you need to have a different page for everybody. So the best way to do that is um, I would have who's ever within your organization um, in a more formal way, setting up all of those pages and that they're, as a, they're an administrator on them. And then what you wanna do is you wanna have other admins. And the only way you pass it off per se is that someone else gets added to the, be able to be the administrator on the page and then you remove the person maybe who moves on. Mm -hmm. But that's why you always want to make sure, I work with a church that they still, we cannot get access to their original Facebook page because somebody else set it up. And I've even tried, you know, sometimes you can go to um, Facebook and you can request to merge them if you provide additional information, but we haven't even been able to get that to happen. So mm -hmm. I know that's the kind of situation you're trying to prevent. So I think you want to make sure that you have a number of admins on there. Definitely some who are um, their staff members at the regional level that mm -hmm. consolidating them and then having others that can come and go. Makes good sense. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. All right, and I see some folks, some other folks are piping in to give advice to Jamie at the Lighthouse, so this is awesome. Um, keep doing that. 
Um, some said they reached more folks through small amounts of paid advertising through Google and Facebook, which I know you're going to get into in a few minutes, Jen, as well as tabling at local events specifically geared toward LGBTQ groups. So a nice combination, right, of face-to-face -face and virtual outreach. Thanks for that, Matthew. Jen, feel free to carry on. Okay. Just quickly, just it's important to be on Facebook. 79% of all internet users are there. Here are the breakdowns of um, Hi, Larry. I see you're back. Yes, I am here. It looks like we lost Jen. Um, maybe she will be able to hop back on. Thanks, guys, for your patience. It's been a few minutes. Get more energy about this. There we are. Jen? Yeah. All right. We lost you for a few minutes. Oh, okay. I'm back. Uh, hi, Beth. But your video is still out. Let me see if there's anything that I can do for my end. Oh, I really am. Hmm. I'm still connected. That's also always good. <laughs> All right, down on, down on your menu bar, you should have an option next to your mute button around video. Do you see anything that you can change there? I can stop the video. Okay, well, I'm, no, no nice start there. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. She's back. It's that that special set. trick of turning it off and turning it on again. <laughs> <laughs> Always do before you call the help desk. All right. Okay. Let me Thank you for that, Jen. And as you catch back up on your presentation, um, Clint is letting us know on Freed Camp that the nonprofit plan is not available to churches. So that's something that's always a little thing that we run into isn't it along the way about some things that apply to nonprofits but not religious ones so thanks clint for keeping your eye on that for us and uh as more resources come about we'll keep you posted on those um so i was just saying about asking questions using that as a way to leverage other folks who love your pages or engage with your content to help promote it um, to get better reach which i know seems kind of counterproductive counterintuitive because the whole reason we have social media is in order to be able to do these things but as you'll see with facebook they make it harder for us um, if you can or brave as i would say use facebook live and short videos don't really post videos that are longer than 60 to 90 seconds because folks do not have the patience to listen to them. Mm -hmm. Jen, are you sharing your screen yet with us? Again? No. Okay. Yes, I'm not. <laughs> oh my. I wanna make sure we don't get behind you. Well, I'm trying to figure out, you know, this is my maiden voyage with Zoom like this. Okay. There All we right. go. Wait. Okay, I'm up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zoom is like that. It takes a little, it's got a little bit of a learning curve on it. Little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now where again? All right, let me come back up here. And where do bar we towards the center. Mm -hmm. Do you guys get to see me making all these faces? <laughs> That's the beauty of webinars. Okay, I think this is the one. Yes, this is the one. Sorry, everybody. Can you see it? 
it's coming back to full screen now. Perfect. So now it won't let me. Oh, here. Start current slide. There we go. Yes. All right, well, we can move on from this page. I think this page is bad luck. The only thing I would say, though, if, if you all don't have the Pages app from Facebook, I encourage you to get it, especially those of you who have more than one um, Facebook page that you're managing. It's also great for those of us who have impulse control related to how much we go down the rabbit hole when we are trying to do our social media work. So you can just have that app on your phone and you can just directly post to the page and you don't have to go through any other personal pages in Facebook. Okay. Blueprint is like this little Facebook school for free, and you can use that to sort of begin to understand what you might want to participate with in Facebook related to advertising. And the reason this is an issue is that it used to be before Facebook was so prevalent, you could go on and you would see everything in your newsfeed. So anybody who made a post, you would see it. Well, as more of us joined in onto the Facebook bandwagon, they knew that if they continued that, Facebook would die because we'd all see everything that everyone posted. So what they developed um, was EdgeRank, which they look at activity. So as you probably could be able to tell when you're on Facebook, if you like something, you might find that you get, you start seeing that person all the time in your newsfeed, or um, maybe there's some ad that you click on, and then all of a sudden, sudden you see so many ads that are related to that particular issue. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that in relationship to these changes, in order for Facebook to move more and to make more money from advertising, over the past few years, it's decreased dramatically related to the organic reach of your content. And what that means is when you post something on Facebook now, if you have 100 people who like your page, only two to three people of that 100, so two to 3%, will actually have your post show up in their newsfeed. So only two to three people, and more likely two, some are even saying it's a lower number now, but to might have the opportunity to view your post. And that is just very demoralizing, but it's the situation that we find ourselves in. And so, you know, one, some of the ways that you can address that is if you were to spend a little time on Blueprint, find out, you know, do you wanna do, do you wanna boost a post or do you wanna do an advertisement? Because Instagram is also owned by Facebook, you can kind of, if you do an ad or you boost a post, you can also do it on Instagram, which can be really nice. Um, but those are just a few things to be thinking about because as you, you know, you may want to, like if you have a program coming up or an event that you really want people to see, it's not a bad idea to spend 10 or $20 and boost that so you get a larger reach. And when you do that, you can really refine who you want to see that particular post. Um, fundraising tools, Facebook has been developing a lot of this, to be perfectly honest. I haven't really dived in too deep to be able to speak to that yet. I'm kind of, again, <laughs> slow adopter. Um, I'm just a little waiting to see how it unfolds. Um, I've been, uh, there's a few folks, NP Tech for Good by Heather Mansfield. She's a great person to be following because she gets out in front of a lot of these trends and tries to look at how it's impacting nonprofits. Um, Facebook Live, which I talked a little bit about. And I really do, if you can consider a modest budget for boosting a few posts, one a month, um, it could be really worth it. It can really help. Um, just kind of quickly, Twitter. I, I, only way I use Twitter is honestly related to politics and seeing what's going on in the world, like in a, a sense of immediacy. So Twitter provides this sense, this urgency, immediacy where you, if there's something that you really need to know. So on the flip side of that, if you want to be using Twitter for your organization or ministry, there are some ways that you can use it best. 
thought leadership is probably the most important one. So if you are doing something, if you're a minister, if your um, organization that you're working in is doing something really interesting and innovative, and you want to make a place for yourself related to whatever that, de that project or program might be, Twitter can be helpful to establish yourself as a thought leader in that particular area. It can be a great way to engage influencers. So if there are other people you know who have more influence than you do, but are interested in your cause or interested in what you're doing, engaging them via Twitter, because the great thing about Twitter is it really flattens hierarchy. So you can have an opportunity to engage with someone that they might either message you or retweet or reply to something of yours. And it's something, somebody that, um, you know, I mean, it could be a celebrity, for goodness sake. So you can have, there's, there's an opportunity in Twitter that um, isn't really in any other social media related to that. The other way I see it can potentially working is media relations. So that's the other area. Like if you see something happening um, and there might be a few people who are eyewitnesses to it, if they post on Twitter, they get bombarded, at least at the early stages, with media wanting to do interviews with them. Um, so I do think if there's some way that you can, you know, if there's something that you're doing that has a timeliness to it, based on something happening in the community, being out there and posting about that can lead to helping you build relationships with media folk. So what I would do is in your community, I'd make sure that you're following all your news channels, you're following all of your, um, media people, your NPR reporters, whoever it might be, make sure you're following all of them. Because if you establish yourself as a thought leader, then also they potentially come to you when they have questions about the issues that you address. I'm going to talk a little bit more about hashtags in a minute. Um, three or fewer posts a day lead to higher engagement. Use photos when you can. Mm. And I do, you know, this is not unlike in Facebook, having some social media ambassadors um, share what you're doing. But with Twitter, you can do the same thing within your network by asking people to retweet. So just kind of quickly, because I'm paying attention to the time. Um, so Instagram, it looks like the, the other half of you had Instagram. And, you know, Instagram is still growing uh, rapidly. Over 40 billion photos are posted to date. 60% uh, of active users are using it each day, and it's only second to Facebook. 90% were 34 or younger, which so if you're in that range, you really need to be in Instagram. Um, some of the challenges, in my opinion, with Instagram, <laughs> you really only post really great photos. Uh, make sure that in the, uh, the kind of description bio section that you include, you have the option to have one live link to a website. So make sure that you're linking to the website that you want to. Um, I talked about the reciprocity between Facebook and Instagram on ads. Um, and balance consistency with quality. One of the things, too, to be thinking about is, you know, if you're going to post once a day, twice a week, whatever, stay with whatever you can be consistent. So it's better to post less and be consistent than to post more often, but do it at an erratic schedule. And this is also, posts should tell a story about your nonprofit's impact and use the captions to help you tell that story. And also hashtags are central with Instagram. So here we go with hashtags. Um, just really quickly, hashtags are like file folders that go into a file cabinet. It's a way to sort through mass amounts of information. And within Twitter, it helps to create communities who have the same interest. It does the same thing uh, on Instagram. Both Twitter and Instagram are the ones who I think rely on hashtags the most. Facebook mm -hmm. has started to allow them in and have you be able to search through Facebook, but still it's more of a Twitter, Instagram thing. Um, you can use them to strategically to educate folks about your mission. And like I said, you can use them across all three platforms. 
they're great if you have an event. So if you're having an event and you want to set up a hashtag for that event in particular, do that and then put it on every single piece of materials that you have about that event to try to gain some traction with folks posting about your event. Um, also give some thought to having one hashtag, just one that you regularly use to identify your organization. And before you choose that hashtag, make sure you do some research about it. So um, sit down and research, you know, the name, um, different ways of saying the name, whatever it might be, to look till you can find one that you can kind of claim that isn't overly inundated with other folks using it. And then the, and when, I, when you guys get this, there'll just be a little link here to talk about um, kind of hashtag 101, really simple. And then I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk to you all about email. So social media is all well and good, but what can happen is relatively, like there was somebody, and I forget the name of the company, they have like 200,000 followers or some insane number on Facebook. And their Facebook account went, just died on them. Am I still here? Mm -hmm. okay. Larry had to go to class, everybody. So <laughs> Larry had to sign off, but we're still here. And uh, Larry's going to keep, uh, Larry's going to uh, get the, um, our chats and conversation on Storify later on. I'm speaking into the void here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but they were on Facebook and then for whatever reason, their account disappeared. And so all of those people that they had been cultivating on social media, they hadn't worked on converting them to their own email email marketing campaign, their own email list. And so unless you do that, they're not really yours. So it's important to be making sure that you're using social media to help drive people so they opt in to receive your email or opt in to learn more about you, because otherwise they're really not yours. So um, whether you have MailChimp or Constant Contact or whatever else you might have, they all have plugins and they all have ways for you to integrate into your, like your Facebook pages. They usually have little widgets you can integrate so that you can try to do as much as you can to drive people. You know, if you do have um, any of those email platforms, what you can also do is, um, you know, maybe every other week, once a month, have one of your social media posts be inviting people to sign up to learn more about your organization so that you're getting that in front of them on a regular basis. And um, things to know related to email marketing is make sure that you're using responsive templates so that they respond to whatever screen the person is looking at, whether it's small, tablet, computer. Um, build your list organically. <clears throat> I can't emphasize this enough. You may have three, 4,000 folks in a database or on an Excel spreadsheet that help that you reach out to for donations. You don't just want to automatically drop those people in when you're building your email marketing list because they haven't directly opted in. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to get a lot of unsubscribes and you'll get <coughs> a lot of people marking you as spam. So it's better to start with a list of 20 and have it gra gradually grow over time because those people will have organically opted into what you're giving them. Email should always be visually compelling, no more than three images and no more than three links. <coughs> Okay, maybe we can stop here and ask a few more questions if you have them before we finish up with Canva. And give Jen a chance to get some water in her. Thank so, you. <laughs> um, <coughs> so thanks for those who uh, have been keeping track with us, um, especially those who've been piping in with your questions. Let's get to some of those now. So Jamie asked a question on the chat box about text messaging. He says his church has been using text in church. 
um, and wants to know if there are any other mass text messaging apps or programs where you can get unlimited text messaging for a fixed price or for a one-time fee. I know at my church they're using GroupMe. I don't know if anyone else has experience with the GroupMe app. Um, that seems to be working fairly well on the user end, but I'm not sure what the church pays for it. So, yeah, the only thing I know of are people are using Slack. That's true. I've heard of Slack as well. But I, you know, mine isn't. So I don't know. Um, I haven't really used it. So if you have some um, that you are familiar with, go ahead and pipe in on the chat and let us hear about them. Then another question we had was back to the video question, Jen. Um, Betty asked the question about how long videos should be, but wondered what should, and you answered that question with 60 or 90 to seconds if it's on Facebook Live, but wasn't sure if she needed to get more message out than that, if she needed more time. Is it better to do a series of short videos? Is it better, um, is the, are the rules different if she's not doing a live video? Um, if she's doing a video that she's then going to later post? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I think if, you know, you, again, think about the audience and then think about the platform that you're using. Now, if you're just going to post something, for example, on your website, if you want to post a longer video, that I think is fine. But if you're doing something that's on social media and you're posting, it's, I, it would be better to do it in short little bites just because folks aren't going to stay on and pay attention for longer than probably 90 seconds. So think about, is there a fun way that you could break it out down into four 90 second, just short little um, clips? Or, you know, use them as, do the, the longer one on, put it on your website, and then do a few clips to lead people into going to the website and learning more. Mm -hmm. The teasers are nice. Mm -hmm. um, now we also have a question from Matthew that says, when you're boosting a post, are there ways to boost only within current likes and not to folks who haven't yet liked? Yes, yes, that's one of the first choices you get to make um, if you only want to boost the post within people who've already liked the page. So you get to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And several of you noted that you learned about this website through Facebook and Casey boosted the post that we made about this web this webinar um, so that more of more folks would see it. And so you're actually living into um, <laughs> some of the, the benefits of boosting a post because it's exactly right. Facebook is showing right, Jen, less and less of yeah. our of our uh, institutional pages. And so we've got to do the footwork on our end to make sure that they see more of us and that's where the email comes in as well because even if they're not seeing our posts on Facebook we're getting them by our email marketing. Emily has some insight. Um, let's see what she says. Our app has a text notification feature that allows us to send a message to all users. We can also access metrics for those messages to see how many people opened. I've heard great things about Slack for internal communications, but not sure how it will work for organizational or public messaging. And when I'm saying, when you said our app, I wasn't sure which one you meant. So go ahead and send us another message if you can, if there's a specific app that does that. Um, but this is, I mean, these are really good pieces that people are trying to work on. And I think this sort of crowdsourcing um, is good for that. After we finish this webinar and we send out the recording, um, feel, if you've learned new things since then, feel free to write me back and I can send your response or insight back out to everybody um, who tuned into this. That's great. And can you do a poll to see how many people are actively using Canva? Yeah, let's do that. And yes, okay, Emily, it is Emily Martin and she may mean the Disciples app. And they, oh, this is an organization she built and it has, they built it with eChurch. I've heard of that. All right, so let's see how many, actually this is an easy one. Let's do this one by raising your hands. Raise your hand if you ever heard of or used Canva. Oh. So far we got six. So out of 30. So a good little chunk, but, but definitely not most. Okay, good, because I don't, I don't want this to be overly redundant for folks. Um, 
So let me open it up. Oh, and then I'm gonna have to um, do a new share, right? That's right. As you're doing that, Betty pointed out that she hasn't been able to add a link for people to sign up with their email, I assume to her Facebook page. Any insight on adding that? Um, yeah, what's her e email platform? Go ahead and write me that on chatter in the in the box, Betty. Oh, is that Betty? Betty, Betty? Who I met? Betty. You did meet Betty. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yes, yeah, so Betty, go ahead and um, let us know. Can you see the new, um, the Canva? I see the new screen, mm -hmm, with the Canva dashboard. Yes, okay, fabulous. Yeah. You're in the right place, and in the meantime, we'll, we'll listen out for you, Betty, but we'll come back to that um, when you've answered us on chat. So um, this may be the same thing. Was it Clint who said that churches can't, with free camp, aren't able to get the premium for free? For nonprofits, right, right. Okay, so uh, you may find the same thing with Canva. I do know that for the 501c3 nonprofits that I've worked with, they've all been able to get a free Canva at work subscription. So Matthew if you is confirming that Canva will do it free for churches. Oh, good. So Canva is pretty much, I love Canva. And a couple of reasons why it's free. It enables me as a harried nonprofit professional create really beautiful graphics because we need any of our posts and if we're using any graphics, they've got to look good. Um, as a culture, we've gotten so used to good design that we know when something doesn't look right. And even if it's just some intuitive sort of sense and it's not consciously discussed, you still will know that. So it's really important um, to make sure that your photos, your images are good. And Canva makes it easy. So um, here's how they make it easy. So if you have a Canva at work account, what it enables you to do, if you go down here from all your designs down to here where it says your brand, if you click on that, What it will allow you to do on, at the front end is choose your brand color templates, your color palettes. So you can see for my organization, we have a lot, but these are the two primaries. And then it also lets you choose your fonts. And it's a place where you can load all of your logos. Like we have a lot of logos. But you can put all of them there so you aren't searching for everything um, kind of last minute as you're in there trying to design something. And this is just, in my opinion, worth its weight in gold. And then what you can do is you can also begin to set up templates that then have your brand and that makes it easier. Like if you wanna have a volunteer work on, say you wanna do social media posts related to maybe inspirational quotes that are tied to your particular program and what you all do. And so you wanna have, you have like 10 things that you wanna do, but you don't have time. So if you have a template set up with your color, with your fonts, you can just easily, pretty easily, hand that off to somebody else. You can add up to 10 team members to your group, um, and they could work on creating them for you. So it's a great way if somebody wants to volunteer and help you, but maybe can't do something out and about, but loves social media, it can be a great way for them to give back. So we have a very small team, because we have a lot of people who don't like computers where we work. Um, and so here I'll just show you a few different, uh, one of the things I like about it too is that with every kind of social media heading, every kind of post, everything has a different size. So a Twitter post versus a Twitter header. And you want to make sure that what you're posting is the right size or other it just won't look right. So 
Canva makes it super easy. So you can come in and if you say you want to do an Instagram post, you can want it, you can do an Instagram post. And you'll know when you post it, it's perfectly sized for Instagram. So everything will look right. Your centering will look right. Your image will look like just the way you want it to. Um, Canva also enables you to do um, PowerPoint. So this is how I do my PowerPoints, honestly, is in here. And then you can look at other things. Here's a resumes, web banners, business cards, brochures. And so for those of us who just don't have the money, honestly, to hire professional graphic designers, which that's always better if you can do that, this is a way to be a stopgap measure until you can. Um, I've done cards on here that I sent in the mail. So there's lots of options. So to show you one little thing, so there's a couple things I'm gonna show you. Um, here, okay, so this is an event we have coming up and I created this image to be our card. And if it comes up, come on, faster, faster, there. So you can see what it looks like. Now, say that this size wasn't going to work for what I needed it to do and I wanted to change the size. All you have to do is come over here and you can change your dimensions. You can change them in a, to a custom way or you can do this magic resize and you can choose how you want it to adapt to those different sizes. So for example, Say you wanted to turn this into a Facebook post and an Instagram post. You hit resize. And you'll see what's happening in the tabs up here. You can see how it's creating the new posts. And then, so then all you're gonna have to do, so for this one, it did a nice job. So it didn't really like cut off too much. But a lot of times what you'll do is you may have to just, you know, change things around a little bit, but then you have that size that you wanted. Um, and then that was for Instagram. And here you can see, here's the Facebook post. And again, it pretty much keeps what you need it to be. You may just want to extend part of your design slightly differently to make sure that it's consistent with your other ones. So it makes it really easy for you to make one standard post and then if you're on different social media platforms, you can go in and do the magic resize and it'll resize to the exact size you need for, you know, for whatever platform you're using. It makes it so beautifully easy. Um, let me come back to here. So if we wanted to create like a new Facebook cover for your organization. And you guys know what she means then with the Facebook cover, right? You have the individual page, you know, where your little face goes, but then you have the big banner that goes across the background. This cover equals that background. Thank you. So say you want it and then you're like, oh, I like this one. And, um, a lot of these are free, so you can use templates, free templates to get yourself started, and then you can change things out that you want to change out, or you can start from a blank. So if I have this and I decide, okay, this is what I wanna to do to Happy New Year for folks, but I need it to be more consistent with my brand, so it looks more like us. So you can come over here, and you see the pink, and then I can just pick to change it out to the blue, which is what my organization would need. And then if you say that this, this font, you're like, well, it's not really the font we should be using. So let me go in and I'll do Gibson is ours. So I'm gonna say, we'll do Gibson. I'm like, oh, well, okay, let's make that smaller. Let's make it bigger. See, people who really know Adobe, I know this annoys them, but it works for me. So then you go through and you can just change all of those things. So now that you've done that, you're like, okay, so it's Gibson 21. So you just go in here and you update all of them. Great. 
And even if you say you're like, okay, that looks nice, but you know, maybe just a little bit more of our brand colors. So what you could also do is even go into the squares themselves and say you wanted to do yellow, nah, that's too much, like some college, orange, nah. Okay, let's use the green. And then once you say, okay, I chose the green, and you're like, okay, now let me make this white. And then you can come back and you can change it to white. So it allows you to move in and out of different graphic elements easily, quickly, and just at the same time to really be in alignment with your brand. And so it looks good. And then I'll show you. So Canva recently, um, it used to be that, um, like that most of the good photographs were a dollar a piece and that was for a 24 hour licensing fee. But now they've made a lot of them free. So you could be like, okay, maybe I don't really want the sparkler. Um, so then you can come in here and you can look at different kinds of photographs. And these are almost all free now. Still some of them aren't, but um, let's say you want to do nature. And what if you wanted, um, and let's say winter. And you can see up here you have a choice of photos or illustrations. You're like, oh, that's kind of nice. Somebody, New Year kind of vibe. And so then say you wanted that one instead. You put it there. And then you have a new photo without a lot of work. <laughs> and if you need to, like I, um, you know, you can see all the things I've uploaded. And so, um, you know, upload all your original things from your organization so you have them there. Um, and then you also can upload, like I showed you, your logos, but it's great to have your logos so handy. Because I don't know if you're like us, but sometimes you have to go down 10 different folders deep into some Microsoft Word file in order to find the right logo. So this way you can keep things really at your fingertips. Um, this section is about the background. So when I change the blue here, I change that background color. And there's lots of choices there. Some of these choices, you can actually change the color. Some of them you can't. And then here within the text, you also, they give you options. So they give you little graphic elements that you can adapt for your needs if you want. So they do that with text, just like they do with some of the templates. Mm -hmm. um, so there's options there. And then, you know, if you set your parameters of what you want your um, brand font to be, then you can load those in and they're always there for you. And it can be a really nice reminder when you're like, oh, I like this font. You're like, but this is the one I have to use because this is the brand standard. I'm sure Casey's happy to hear me say that. <laughs> Casey absolutely has brand standards for us. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> and then the different elements that you can, uh, one of the things that's new, that I think is great for those of us who, um, like if you're doing maybe an annual report or you're doing a flyer, something that you want to have a chart on there, um, they have these charts now that you can add and then you can edit them to be reflective of whatever you need. So you can have colors that are in alignment with your brand colors. Um, you can personalize them, customize them in whatever way you need. And you're creating really nice graphics that, to be perfectly honest, I don't know how else we would do it. Publisher? I mean, mm -hmm. maybe Word. Maybe some people use PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, it gives us like lots of really great options. And one of the new things that, not, that I haven't used yet, but I would like to, is up here, if you see, uh, it says order prints. So clearly they've connected with some printer. I don't know who is doing the print for them because I haven't ordered any yet, but um, I'm gonna try and see what happens and how much I like them. But so then it becomes, oh my gosh, what if you create a flyer for your organization and then you get it printed? How easy is that? And then you can download everything in different, you can do PNG files, JPEG files, PDF standard, and PDF print. And now you can even do GIFs, which I haven't done, but 
again, late adopter here. Okay. But those are kind of the key things I wanted to show you in Canva because it is a really an amazing, amazing resource. And they are always, always adding new capabilities in it. Thank you so much for this, Jen. This was good. It's a good overview of Canva, which we also love at MBA. Um, and I am also a Canva ambassador and just tell people wherever <laughs> I go, you should use this free resource to start building things. Um, so I'm glad to see that. Why don't we take this time um, to just regroup and um, remember the things that Jen has talked to us about. I, we heard about setting goals for your social media and email marketing um, campaigns and work. We heard about finding the tools you need to organize yourself um, and to organize your outgoing posts, how to manage the posts that you have coming, um, coming in and going up on your behalf, and then tools like Canva that can help you um, create high quality materials um, for your outreach work. So if you have any final questions, feel free to um, get them to me now via the Q&A box or the chat box. I want to pick up with Betty's question. Betty was asking about adding a link for people to sign up with, e with their email for her organization via Facebook. She did answer the question that she's using Facebook on her phone and laptop, which is an Android platform. Uh, so I guess my question is, how is she doing her email marketing? Because that, uh, okay. that would be um, that platform, that software, email, uh, MailChimp, Constant Contact. I'm trying to think of who are some of the other lower cost ones. Um, because the, that is who would have the widget or the app that you can add into the Facebook page. I see what you're saying. So it's not native to Facebook, you're bringing in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you're importing it in. You're importing in. A, so Betty, you see now that means getting, choosing a platform for how you want to send your emails out and then using that to give you what you need um, to add to your Facebook page so that people can sign up through the Facebook page. That's good insight. I have Linda asking to, to say more about what boosting is. Uh, she had to take a phone call when that was coming up. Um, and may, there may be others who um, we were just using the word and throwing it around and, and maybe we didn't get give the insight that we needed. So Jen, you want to say a little bit more about boosting? Sure. So boosting and advertising or Facebook are both pretty similar. But what boosting is, is you boost a particular post, whereas Facebook, you're really creating an ad. Um, and so they honestly can kind of, in my experience, sort of serve the same purpose. Um, but boosting is taking something that you've already done and just boosting it. And so more people have an opportunity to see it and you get to drive who you want to see it with more intentionality. Um, so whether that's people who haven't liked your page, but are between the ages of 30 and 35 and are women or whatever it might be, because you can set all those parameters um, within it once you decide to boost something. Now the advertisements, um, Facebook is kind of particular on the ads because they don't want a certain amount of text on the images. So with those, sometimes if you want to do an ad and you start to do it, it has to go through a, a, a referral process or a review process. And so if it's too text heavy, they may come back and tell you what you have to do differently in order to have it um, be able to be a full fledged ad on Facebook. But it does look like you can build Facebook ads on Canva mm. as well. So yes, no, no, it doesn't have that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do everything on Canva. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can, you can build your Facebook ad on Canva. We did have another Canva question, which is, is it intuitive how you get to that Canva for nonprofits or that Canva for work with the nonprofit deal? Can yeah. You but I, I, I will make sure that you guys have the link. Okay. 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 Um, cause it might look different. This is from a few months ago, so it might look different now. So I'll make sure that you have that. Excellent. But if you just search nonprofit in Canva mm -hmm. and free, it should come up. Okay. Perfect. And then Jamie had a question, uh, that his church started an Instagram account yesterday, um, and wants to know where to begin. How did they kick off an Instagram account? What are creative launch ideas? So I'm posing this question to you, Jen, but I'm also posing it to all of our attendees. Feel free to pipe in and, and uh, 
share what launch ideas you have. Well, I would first ask you, what's your goal with doing the Instagram? Why are you guys on Instagram? What are you hoping to get out of it? You need to unlock your iPhone first. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think based on that, um, you could have, I mean, there's just so many, I'm sorry, there's just so many things you can think about. I mean, depending on what, did he answer what he wanted? He did. So he said, we want to get more folks to attend our Sunday morning worship service. Okay, so I would start showing elements like the things about the Sunday worship service that are maybe the most fun or things that are more interesting for people that kind of might break down the um, barrier of what to expect if they're there for the first time. Um, you could do something where you could have people posting also, um, you know, first get some following in there of your own internal people. Um, I would encourage you to sort of maybe you could do kind of a, a quick blast of the folks who are gathered for a particular service and maybe invite all of them to take some pictures as they're leaving that day or even during the service and have them all, I don't know if you have your hashtag figured out yet, but have them tag all of those photos and then those start popping up and automatically people are going to be seeing it based on what you're doing. So you may, before you do something like that, you may want to try to have 15 to 20 posts already done so that when people go to it they're like they're not like oh there's nothing here so you may want to preload a lot of those things that you think help convey the essence of um your per the personality of the church how people interact with each other what do people say what they like about you what's meaningful to them find ways to sort of graphically take photos of that element or to create things on Canva. If there's another good thing you can always do is um, depending on the sermon lesson or maybe whatever the reading was, you can always lift something up from that and also turn that into a post. One of the churches that I'm with is um, they do an affirmation every Sunday. So what I do for them is I make in Canva, I do all of their affirmations and I make sure that it, it gets posted right as soon as the service is over. Mm -hmm. um, and then people share that. And that's another thing that you can do that kind of, or in advance of this, what we're starting to do now is in advance of the service, um, the service coming up, we put out a teaser about what to expect that particular Sunday. Maybe it's something from um, the senior minister, what he's writing or a quote that he knows he's going to use, or we do something to try to invite people. So we have a related question um, about using Facebook Live to stream whole services or just the sermon. So what is the, Chris is asking what your view is on that, Jen, um, especially given that insight that you just shared with us about keeping videos to 60 or 90 seconds, 60 or 90 seconds. He asked, is it better to just post those videos to the church website? I think it'd be, it'd be better to post them to the church website and do that idea of a teaser. Or I would, I'd be asking, are you using um, a podcast software or something to do? Are you doing video or is it audio and video? Is it just one? Um, and then what software are you using for that? And how is, um, and are you putting that on your website? And then see what then you can do is, for example, with a lot of that software, you can have a picture from the service and then you can share that to Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media you have with the link. And then people could link to that particular lesson or sermon. Now, you know, that's a leads to a question that I've had too related to that in terms of goals, which you were talking about earlier, Jen, remembering what your goals are. If your goal, however, is to have the service up for sick and shut in members, for example, versus um, having it up to attract new members, is, is, are the rules different or would you stick with that? Well, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I haven't sat and watched through an hour of Facebook Live, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so... I mean, I've watched a few minutes, I've watched 10 minutes, 
you know, what you might want to do is try experimenting with it and see what happens. I mean, that's the beauty of this. I mean, give it a try, get some feedback, and then that can help you make that next step. Maybe, maybe folks will love it, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they won't. but you can try and see. I mean, that's the beauty of all of this. And let that feedback guide you. Mm -hmm. Learning as we go. <laughs> Um, Jamie wants to know if there's some way to Facebook live stream using something other than a cell phone. I know you can use an iPad. I've seen folks doing that before. And can you not do it just on your computer with the webcam? I would assume that you could. And maybe if you had a web enabled, I know there are some web enabled cameras out there, but I don't know if you'd be able to I don't know if they're that advanced or if they're that connected to that point, you probably have to get into your user manual. Um, but I think any laptop, phone, computer, tablet that you have. What's the, um, I feel like there's a question behind that question. Like, is there a specific example that you're thinking of that you want to, is there a reason why like the phone or, you know, what, what is like, is there, Oh, Jamie's saying, I feel like the quality of phones is poor. Exactly. So um, I get that. And that was another thing I was going to say with um, the person who asked about doing Facebook Live for the whole service, because then it might not, the quality might not be that great. Um, you know, I, on some level, you have to be thinking that, you know, the quality is only going to improve over time. So depending on what your goal is, I think we might have to let go of the idea of it being a real high quality looking video because it's not really meant to function that way. I mean, it's supposed to be quick, easy, something that people can engage. Um, and if you want something more than that, then I think you have to look at a higher quality camera. Now, Miss Eats, it's totally changed direction. And as we sort of wrap up here, um, asked a question about LinkedIn oh. and wanted to know just in general what your thoughts are on LinkedIn. And someone else seconded that question. Elaine also wanted to know that. Okay, super. So, um, and then we'll wrap up because I know we're at. Uh, and a couple, couple ways I look at LinkedIn is I look at LinkedIn more as a way to maybe leverage and build relationships with corporations and potential donors. Now, because LinkedIn, you have to do everything individually, it becomes a way that you individually connect with folks. So, um, you know, cause you don't connect, you can follow a company, but you don't connect with a company. So if you are in a role where you are the lead of the organization or the lead messenger, then, you know, I think LinkedIn can be a great way to connect with people who could potentially be donors or help you in ways. And in order to do that, then I would really encourage you to use their internal blogging platform called Pulse. Because that's a great way, like if you write a short article with that, um, something about what you're doing, you can begin to get engagement. Um, I think it also can be a nice way to thank donors, especially corporations who are helping you in some way. Like if someone's giving you some in-kind gifts for something, you could go on to LinkedIn if they're active on LinkedIn and um, post them and th post and thank them there, which will give them, I think almost more exposure within their peer community as opposed to Facebook might be more customer related. Thank you, Missy. That was a great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. All right, folks. Well, we have reached the end of our time plus three minutes. So we just want to thank Jen so much for sharing her wisdom today um, and her insights. Again, we have recorded this webinar today. So I'm going to, as soon as it's ready, I'm going to post the link to the recorded video. There should be a video with audio and then an audio without video option available um, for this webinar. We're also going to share with you the presentation that you saw today, the slides, and um, the resources, list of resources that Jen made reference to throughout the presentation. Um, we want to thank you on behalf of the National Benevolent Association for joining us today. 
um, and we'll be in touch with all the promised information. I see uh, a lot of thanks and goodbyes and we love yous um, in the chats. So thank you so much for that. And um, we just really appreciate you guys tuning in today. I'll leave this open for a few more minutes um, in case you would like to save the chat window. There were a few links that were shared in the chat window and you have that option. If you go down to the two, um, down to the bottom of that chat window, it'll say two and this to the right, it'll say more. When you click on more, you have the option to save the chat. So I recommend that you do that and that'll save it to your computer's desktop. Otherwise, we'll see you guys again next time. Like I said, I'll hang out here for another few minutes. Um, Jen, you can hang out here if you want or you can sign off um, if you'd like. And if there are any other questions that come up for you, we'll be sure to make sure you get them. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any other questions or if you want to be in touch with me and ask them, it's all good. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I think we're going to do, Jen, that um, Canva for work for nonprofits. Do you guys have it? No, we've been sort of using it more casually, but I think casually within the organization, but I think now we're ready to, to yeah. make the commitment. It's going to rock the world of the people who are very specific about brand standards. <laughs> I mean, we need it because it's, it's, and we've had a lot of brands over the years, so it's nice to be all on the same page and making yeah. consistent materials. And Because what you guys have is just beautiful, so you want it to always look that good. I heard... For those of you who aren't able to save the chat, I've saved it and so I can send it. Just send me a quick email and let me know you want it. Oh, Vanetta, that's a great way to have found us. She found it when trying to download Disciples events to her calendar and this came up. How exciting. We probably have Sherilyn to thank for that. So uh, Sherilyn Williams in the Disciples Communications Office, so we're thankful. Jen, I'm gonna also include your email on the follow-up email. Is that cool? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And I've got all of it um, on the front page of the presentation. I've got all kinds of different ways to contact me. Oh, perfect. Okay, we will do that then. That too. You can test me and see how responsive I am on other social media. <laughs> uh, there are some social media things that will tell you how responsive the, the person you're reaching out to is. Is that still Facebook or is that something else I'm thinking of? Facebook. Okay, okay. Yeah. And if you miss one, it averages it. Oh, you're really bad. A lot of pressure. <laughs> you're really bad. <laughs> like the old days of eBay when you never, you always wanted to have 100%, you know, people satisfied with you. My dad yeah. wouldn't let me sell him any of um, use his eBay account because he guarded his hundred percent. He didn't <laughs> think that I was gonna <laughs> That's the same thing with that Facebook. Those are the days. Level of responsiveness. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I'll go ahead and wrap up here. Um, Jen, we can continue um, our conversations offline. Anything you need, just send me an email. Okay. Everybody awesome. else who's still hanging on, I'm gonna get in the end the meeting, but thanks again for coming. Bye. <laughs>